Recently, I spent several years of my life trying to make sense of two research findings. First, the average marriage is getting worse. People were happier with their marriage in the past than we are today. Why is that? Second, the effect of having a good versus a not so good relationship on our overall quality of life is getting stronger. In fact, psychologically speaking, relationship quality is almost twice as important today as it was just a few decades ago. Why is that? In my relationships and motivation lab at Northwestern University, we conduct psychology research. We might, for example, bring couples into the lab and videotape them interacting and then code their behavior and then follow them over time. But to answer these big ambitious social questions, we need more than just psychology. The problem is academics tend to be siloed. Disciplines tend to be siloed. So I wasn't particularly knowledgeable about the history of marriage, the sociology of marriage, the economics of marriage. And I launched myself on a voyage to try to understand everything that I could figure out everything that scholars had figured out about the nature of marriage across all of the disciplines. And while I was on this voyage, every time I, I got to a different port, every time I read an article, every time I discovered a new discipline, I always brought a psychological lens to try to understand whether I could yield or produce a coherent theory of how marriage actually functions. Well, when I got back, from my voyage, I did. I built, I built a framework, I call it the all or, nothing, all or Nothing Theory of Marriage, and I collaborated with a, a friend of mine, the uh, dating coach, Logan Yuri, to build for your viewing pleasure a three-minute video summarizing the several thousand hours of learnings that I had on my, on my tour. Married for love? For most of history, the idea of the <coughs> marriage was essential for day-to-day -day survival for reproduction and social acceptance. Today, we marry for love and so much more. Graham Maslow is our unlikely tour guide. Maybe you learned in Psych 101 about his hierarchy of needs, with physiological and safety needs at the bottom, belonging and love needs in the middle, and esteem and self-actualization needs at the top. Like a video game of life, you can't pursue the higher needs until you've met the lower ones. For thousands of years, spouses were working this. They struggled together to produce the food, clothing, and shelter required to survive. Then, starting around 1850, America and other Western nations industrialized. Increasing wealth meant that more people could meet those low-level needs without being married. For the first time ever, personal fulfillment became a primary goal of marriage, which jumped up to Maslow's love and belonging level. Spouses went from workmates to souls. But this early version of soulmate marriage was based on the idea that men and women should adhere to radically different gender stereotypes in order to inspire love. The assertive breadwinner married the nurturing homemaker. In the 1960s, people staged a full-on revolt against these constricting social roles. Individuality, freedom of expression, and authenticity became the holy grail. Today, we still marry for love, but we also require that our partner help us grow toward our authentic self. Michelangelo said that sculpting is not about creating a sculpture, but about revealing. Chiseling and polishing the block of marble to reveal the beautiful form slumbering within. Similarly, married people began looking to their partner to sculpt away their flaws and facades, bringing forth the authentic self buried within. The climb of marriage up Maslow's hierarchy creates a paradox. On one hand, as our expectations become increasingly complex, more marriages fall short. To meet our highest needs, our partner must understand us profoundly. Even if we invest tons of time and effort in the relationship, which most of us aren't doing, there's no guarantee we'll attain this level of understanding. From this perspective, it's no surprise that the divorce rate doubled between 1960 and 1980, reaching 50%, or that the average marriage is less satisfying today than it was a few decades ago. On the other hand, the best marriages today are better than the best marriages of earlier eras. When they do manage to fulfill our highest needs, we can achieve, in Maslow's words, profound happiness, serenity, and richness of the inner life. <clears throat> in our grandparents' era, a loving and respectful marriage generally made people happy. Today, many of us find such a marriage disappointing if it doesn't also facilitate our voyage of self-discovery and personal growth. But those of us whose marriage achieves all of that 
enjoy a level of marital fulfillment that grandma and grandpa wouldn't have dreamed possible. So this puts us in a position, this framework that we built puts us in a position to revisit those key findings. Why is it that the average marriage is getting worse? Well, in part, it's because meeting higher needs requires a deeper level of communication and understanding, which means that many of us are disappointed with the level of connection that would have been totally adequate in our grandparents' era. Similarly, why is relationship quality getting more important over time? Well, in part, because success versus failure at meeting higher needs has has a greater impact on richness of the inner life. So it's, of course, essential to get enough food that we don't starve and to have enough shelter that we don't freeze. But it's really those needs up at the top of Maslow's hierarchy where meeting them yields this profound sense of richness of the inner life, of happiness, of serenity, and failing to meet them yields the opposite of that. So that's why we're seeing that the effects of having a high-quality marriage have been the high quality relationship on our overall quality of life have gotten stronger. Now, these understandings pose two new questions, both of which are much more practical. The first one is, can we, you, I, all of us, can we use any of this knowledge to try to build a stronger relationship for ourselves? And second, a sort of related question is, dare we hope for an exquisite marriage? I'm talking like, oh, we could shoot for the top, we can have these exquisite marriages, but would we be better off shooting for the good enough marriage rather than the exquisite marriage? Or stated otherwise, are we better off settling in at base camp rather than shooting for the the summit? Now, these questions are interesting to me because I'm a professor who studies relationships for a living, but that's not the only reason why I'm interested. I, too, would like to build the strongest marriage that I can. So, in a sense, we can distill everything we've talked about thus far down to supply and demand. Demand is what we're asking of our marriage, and supply is what the marriage can realistically provide in light of our level of compatibility and the amount of investment we're making in the relationship. This supply and demand logic suggests two major strategies we can use if we want to try to improve our marriage. If we're in a situation where what we're expecting of the marriage is higher than what the marriage is actually delivering, we can ask more, uh, we can invest more in the marriage so that it can actually meet what we're asking, or alternatively, we can ask less of the marriage so that it aligns with what the marriage can realistically provide. So let's consider those two options in detail. So with regard to investing more, I I think we need to start with how we construe love. Now, if somebody said to you, when the right violin comes along, I'm going to be a spectacular musician, you, you would find that person completely preposterous. But a lot of us adopt a mentality that isn't all that different with regard to love. We feel like Boy, I'm hanging out here just looking for the right person, and then we think things are going to fall into place. But the reality that loving, that relationship skills more generally, is a suite of skills that we need to develop, that we need to cultivate, both in ourselves and, once we're paired, in collaboration with our partner, right? And this is the logic behind investing more. Now, most relationships advice falls into this strategy of investing more. So... A lot of that advice is, advice is pretty good. Date nights really are beneficial most of the time. And good communication skill, that's a great thing. Strengthen your communication. In fact, probably the best reason why good communication skills are valuable is that you fight less about stupid stuff. So we don't want to eliminate all fights or arguments from your relationship, but, but good communication skills can get rid of the 90% that's actually stupid. So developing those skills is a good idea. With regard to trying to stay, sustain sexual fulfillment in the relationship, I, I'm a particular fan of the relationship columnist Dan Savage's advice to be good giving and game. What does that mean? It means to try to make yourself sexually skilled, to be sexually generous, and to be up for anything within reason. And, but when we hear this advice, when we typically hear this advice about how to make our relationships better, it's in sufficiently couched within the context of, well, how are things going in the relationship these days, and can the relationship really deliver on those sorts of things we're looking for? So, for example, if you are young and there are, if you have two young children at home and both of you are stressed out about your careers at the moment, is that the right time to try to figure out how to find the, the optimal date night for you guys or to develop better communication skills or to f- make sure that you have hot sex when it's been hard to do? Probably not, right? You may not have the bandwidth right now to try to make those additional investments in the relationship. And there is no shame in asking a little bit less, which brings us to our second major strategy. We can ask less. 
of the relationship. I, I recognize that this is an awkward time of the talk to introduce my wife, but here she is. This is Allison, um, who, by the way, thinks it is hilarious that I'm a marriage expert. Now, we started off doing pretty well. Um, here we are, uh, the day we got engaged on a cross-country skiing trip, and, and here we are on our wedding day. Things were going great, but over the next couple years, which included a brutal pregnancy and a very difficult adjustment to parenthood, things got bad in the relationship. There was an increasing disconnect between the amount of emotional connection that we wanted to have in the relationship and the amount that we were actually able to achieve. And on one particularly bad spring day in 2010, I broke a little bit. I said, I need to stop trying to be happy in this marriage. I need to stop trying to feel close with you because these efforts keep failing. And that is a source of anguish for me. That was a terrible day and a terrible conversation. It was also a first step toward writing the marriage. When we think about asking less, how should you ask less? Well, I can't tell you because I don't know your exact relationship. If your partner is exhausted about all the stressing out you're doing about work, maybe it's time to rekindle your friendship with your old college roommate who was always a, a good listener. If you feel like you're overly dependent on your partner for the motivation to exercise, maybe it's a good time to find a tennis buddy. If you feel stressed out about the idea that you might be sexually monogamous for the next 60 years, maybe it's time to explore the possibility of opening up the relationship to some degree. You didn't see that one coming, did you? Um, some of you might prefer to stick with tennis. But the bottom line is, we look to our partner these days to fulfill a large range of emotional and psychological needs, and nobody is going to be able to offer excellent support in all of those ways. So we can focus on ways that we're looking for our partner to do things where she or he probably isn't the optimal person for that and we can reduce the stress on the relationship. Now, as I've said, we can, we can invest more in the relationship, we can ask less, those are two good strategies. There's actually a third one, which is uh, inspired in part by the novelist Marcel Proust, who argued that mystery is not about traveling to new places, but about looking with new eyes. Now look, traveling to new places is a great way to invest more in your relationship, but he's right that looking with new eyes is also a powerful way to us to, for us to invest in the relationship, and it's also a whole lot cheaper and a whole lot faster. What does it mean to look with new eyes? Well, it leverages the whole logic of, of this third uh, this third strategy leverages the fact that we experience the world as if what, what we imagine is true is actually true out there in the world, but that is false. All of us are experiencing a social world that is distorted through our own biases. And even though that might sound depressing, it actually gives us something like a mini relationship superpower. Because if we experience the world through distortions, and we have some control over those distortions, we get to choose how we view the situation. If our partner shows up late, we get to choose whether that's a story about what a jerk he is or whether that's a story about, eh, nobody's perfect. If we're having a big fight, we get to choose whether that's a story about how fundamentally incompatible we are or a story about how we can use this as an opportunity to learn about each other and strengthen the relationship. As we go through our everyday life, we get to choose whether to feel aggrieved by our partner's limitations or grateful for her strengths. We've seen that the best marriages today are better than the best marriages in the past, but we've also seen that the average marriage is getting worse. What this means is that we can achieve today an exquisite, a particularly exquisite relationship, but that it doesn't come cheap. We need to use a wise blend of the three strategies. We're more compatible with our partner in some ways than in others. We have more bandwidth for the relationship sometimes than at other times. And so we need to use a wise blend. We need to decide we, right now, how specifically are we going to invest more in our relationship? We, right now, how specifically are we going to ask less of the relationship? And we, both as individuals and as a couple, how is it that we are going to try to look with new eyes at the relationship? And if you really want an exquisite marriage and you're willing to work like that to try to make it happen, 
what a great time to be alive. Now, I barely relate to the guy who struggled so much in 2010. After about a year or two at base camp, Allison and I started to summit, started to climb a little bit again, slowly at first, and then after the kids got older, with more gusto. And lately, we've been enjoying a lot of time up there at the summit. It's a good moment for our marriage. But I hope we never forget the lesson of 2010, which is when it's really not working, when there's this big discrepancy and you're bumping up against it everywhere you turn, descend to base camp. I hope we never forget that, and I hope it never takes me as long again to sort of give up on some of the things I was looking for from the marriage. We can hunker down in base camp, we can regroup, and we can live to ascend to the top of that summit once again when the time allows. But one other lesson I hope we never forget. We should never miss an opportunity to push for the summit because, as you can see, the view is gorgeous.